It's a great pleasure to be here. It's a lovely, lovely day in Chicago. Um, I want to talk to you today about values, because an issue that's long perplexed me is where moral values come from. How is it that we can actually care about what happens to other people, that we can incur a cost to ourselves in order to do something beneficial for somebody else? Where does that really come from? Now, it becomes a particularly interesting question because we know now quite a bit about how biological evolution works. We know that an animal has to, be, has to have a nervous system organized to see to its own survival so that it can reproduce and pass on its genes. As Paul McLean famously said, Nature selects for animals who succeed at the four Fs. Feeding, fleeing, fighting, and reproduction. <laughs> and so, in a certain sense, the circuitry always has to be there in order that we can survive and make our way on the planet. And that sort of means that it, the circuitry is self-centered, or as you might say, selfish. And yet we know that many humans cooperate with others, care about others, sacrifice for others, and that this is true not only actually of humans, but it's also true of other mammals. So we know something about the deepest level of value. Where does the value of caring for others, where does that come from? Now, as you know, many people have had the idea that it must have a sort of supernatural source. And this has not been terribly appealing because we think that humans have been around on the planet for something like a quarter of a million years. And for most of that time, they did not have anything like organized religion. So it motivated Darwin to think about the issue rather differently and looking at social mammals and social birds in general, he said they must have social instincts. There must be something valuable about being a social animal. There must also be the capacity to develop habits and skills that you learn from the social practices of your group. And finally, there must be a capacity for problem solving. Now, as evolution developed some 200 million years ago, something very remarkable happened, and that is mammals began to appear. First, of course, there were reptiles that were warm-blooded, and that was a huge advantage because it meant uh, that they could forage at night and they could forage when it was cold. But it also meant that they had to eat about 10 times as much. And so over time, there developed a very complicated circuitry so that animals uh, would uh, have the capacity to forage in all kinds of different places, and that usually meant that they had to be born very premature. Why? Because they had to be able to learn from the environment, not just to rely on reflexes and instincts. But to learn a lot from the environment means you have to be born very immature. And the more immature, really, then the longer the time you have to tune yourself up, to tune your brain up to the environment. That presents a problem. And exactly how evolution solved this problem, we're not sure. But what we do know is that something very new changed with mammals. And that is that there was the caring for another just as you might care for yourself. So uh, what we saw was then that there is a kind of a trade-off between independence in the way that a turtle will be born very independent and the learning capacity. So dependence means then that you have to somehow have the circuitry there so that I care for 
the offspring in just the way that I care for myself. Just as I, mother rat, see to my own food and, and warmth and safety, so I must see to the warmth and safety of the offspring. It's like the offspring becomes an extension of myself. Now, of course, sociality also developed in, in, in insects and in fish, but it's a very different kind of sociality. And the circuitry that developed in mammals and in birds seems to be quite different. It relies on several things, pain and pleasure, so that the mother and the offspring feel good when they are together, they feel pain when they are separated. The baby squeals when it's hungry. That causes the mother's stress levels to go up. The cortisol that Dan Levitan talked about goes up, and she takes corrective action. <clears throat> the hub of the story, but only the hub because there are masses of chemicals and neurons involved, is a very simple, very ancient peptide called oxytocin. And in mammals, it's put to a lot of new jobs, but mainly ensuring that there is this caring um, for others. So with mammals, we see this extension of the domain where the brain manages uh, well-being. And I just want to show you in this slide, first of all, the general picture of the brain, and, that, and to remind you that the hypothalamus a very, very ancient structure is also very tiny. And in the blow-up of the hypothalamus, you can see that oxytocin is both released into the body as a whole, but it's also released into the brain. And some people, for example, Dan Levitan, are experimenting with oxytocin introduced intranasally into a mouse or into a human to see how that changes their social behavior. And just briefly, I can say uh, that it does seem to have an effect. Now, I don't want you to think that oxytocin is sort of the be-all and the end-all here. It's a very important part of the story, but it's only a part of the story. So what really does oxytocin do? And part of the answer, and this also relates then to Dan's observations about cortisol, is that as oxytocin levels go up in the brain, stress hormones go down. So part of what happens when oxytocin is released in the brain is that it makes you feel good. It makes you feel good because cortisol makes you feel anxious, afraid, concerned, vigilant, and that goes down. You feel relaxed. You feel that things are good, that, and it's sometimes then called uh, a safety signal. This doesn't mean that it's sort of a pleasure molecule in and of itself. It is not, as so-called Dr. Love would say, uh, a love molecule, but it does interact with neurons that are part of the circuitry for forming bonds, social bonds. It's also been found, and the pioneering studies were done in Canada uh, with Michael Meany, it's been found in rat studies that if you separate a rat pup from the mum and put it in isolation, warm and fed, but in social isolation, for a couple of hours a day and then return it, that that rat pup will grow up to be socially compromised. In particular, if it's a female, she will tend not to be uh, a very good mother. And of course, as you would imagine, research is now also being pursued regarding a similar kind of phenomenon that may obtain in humans. So part of the story then that I've had to tell you is about how we make this large step from being essentially self-centered to caring for others. But the others are just the offspring. So now the question is, how do social mammals go the next step? How do they get beyond caring just for offspring to caring for mates or friends and so forth? And what we think is that a relatively small genetic change builds on this more fundamental change. And this small genetic change will allow for things like caring for mates. <clears throat> 
So I'm now going to tell you a story that you may already know about the prairie voles and contrast it to the mountain voles. So the montane voles are kind of the stereotypical vole or, or rodent. So the male and the female meet, and they mate, and then he goes off looking for more action, and she goes, uh, and now she's pregnant, and she's eventually going to have the babies. Thought. Prairie voles are very different. So the male and the female come together, they meet, they mate, and they stay together. And especially once the babies are born, they are really, truly bonded for life. What that means is the male guards the nest against other females as well as other males. He also takes a very active role in caring for the pups. And they like to be together. <laughs> And so they become depressed if you, are, if you separate them and put them in different places. And, and that's very easily measured by how active they are and whether they will eat and so forth. So there's something very special about the prairie vole brain. And so the question is, what's the difference in the brain between the prairie vole and the montane vole? I'm just going to very quickly tell you that oxytocin turned out to be a very important part of the story along with its close relative vasopressin. Now, as I'm sure you know, for a neuron to work, uh, there must be interaction between chemicals on the outside and the neuron itself. And in particular, for oxytocin to have any effect on a neuron, it has to find the kind of lock to fit him. And that's the receptor. And once it locks in on the receptor, it modifies the activity level of the neuron. So it turns out that for prairie voles, there's a very high density of receptors in one very specific place in the pain-pleasure reward system as compared to montane voles. And similarly, vasopressin, again, there's very high density of receptors for vasopressin, the, the sibling peptide to oxytocin, in one very specific part of the reward system. And if you block those receptors, you block the behavior. And so we think that the small genetic change that permits bonding and attachment in the case of mates is regulated and mediated uh, by a, a gene that has to do with receptor density. Very interesting. And so we think that for social mammals, you're looking at marmosets up on, on the top, where, again, they bond for life. The male takes a greater role, actually, in the raising of the young uh, than the female. We think that these all involve changes in the genes that regulate this very important circuitry in the hypothalamus for attachment uh, and bonding. Now, because I have very little time, I'm going to have to sort of leave that story and go to the second part of what Darwin said, and that is the importance of learning norms and social practices. And what, one of the things that we know that is true, we can see this in wolves, we can see it in rats, and we can certainly see it in humans, is that the young pick up the social practices by approval and disapproval of their group. And this involves cortex, yes, but much more importantly, it involves subcortical structures that have to do with reinforcement learning. And of course, in very small groups, in the hunter-gatherer period of our ancestors, this would have been uh, a very, very important way of regulating social behavior within the group. Everybody would know everybody else, and uh, a disapproving look or a frown would actually carry a lot of significance and would help uh, in the control of the behavior. Much of the learning is implicit we all have an understanding of some social rules that we can't even articulate, such as how close to stand to someone when you first meet them, 
I can tell when they're too close. I can tell when it's too far away. But I cannot actually articulate to you what precisely it should be. And so for many, many norms. And this also helps us understand how it can be that norms can vary somewhat, although the basic structure of sociality can remain the same, how there can be variation um, in norms. But as the population grows, then, of course, not everybody knows everybody else, and there has to be a development of institutions. And this came about uh, with um, the advent of agriculture. I use this slide just to remind myself that, of course, self-centeredness does not go away <laughs> in social groups, and nor does aggression. But in all social animals, within group aggression is tightly controlled. I'm going to finish with this slide. <laughs> I know, it's kind of a cheesy slide, but I like it. And it actually has a scientific purpose. And the scientific purpose is this. We all think of orangs as being loners, and indeed they are in the wild, because they are vegetarians, they have to have a huge territory in which to forage. But given the resources, change the resources only a little bit. And they like to have friends, they bond, and this dog and this orang found each other in a rescue center. They do everything together. They are inseparable. <laughs> Namaste.